Welcome, welcome to our FinCon X breakout session panel of experts. I'm John Lanza, and I am the creator of The Money Mammals and the author of The Art of Allowance. I help parents raise money smart kids, and I am really excited to host this wonderful panel of money experts, all of whom I've been really fortunate to interview on my Art of Allowance podcast. And we are going to have a conversation today that I hope will help you raise money smart kids in a not so money smart consumption oriented world. And let's face it, becoming money smart is tough enough for many of us to achieve ourselves. It's one of the key topics at FinCon, money smarts obviously. And if we're not experts as parents, how can we possibly raise money smart kids? Where do we begin? Well, I think this group of financial experts who are also all fellow parents will help us explore some tips and tactics that we can use to armor our kids for battle in the real world. And it is a battle out there. Um, our focus today will be as practical as possible. And my hope is that for the content creators out there, we'll give you some perspective that you may not have considered in the personal finance world. And for parents, that you come away with the confidence to get started with a program for your kids or to improve whatever system you've already set up with them to help them become money smart and hopefully money empowered. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Cameron Huddleston. She is an award-winning personal finance journalist and author of Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk, and she is a mom of three. We have Bill Dwight, chief dad at FAMZU. He is preparing kids for the financial jungle. We have Trey Bodge, a, national, a journalist and on-air contributor specializing in smart shopping and personal finance and mom. Robin Tobe is not your typical accountant. She's a best-selling author and speaker and the mom of two young adults. And Laura Levine, president and CEO of the Jumpstart Coalition, is an advocate for financial education, inclusion, and well-being. And I want to welcome you all. Because our time is short, I'd like to dive right into our questions. And I will direct, uh, for the audience out there, just to let you know, I will direct at least one question to each of our panelists. Uh, before they answer, I'll, I will have them give you a little fun fact about themselves that folks might not know. So let's start with money empowerment. I'm gonna direct this question to Robin Tobe. Um, I mentioned this in the, in the intro, this idea of money empowerment, and I'd, I'd like each of you, starting with Robin, to give me your definition of the term money empowerment. So we kind of have a starting point for where we're going. And uh, before we do that, though, Robin, fun fact. So my fun fact is that in 2007, at a concert in Toronto, where I live, I met Bruce Springsteen backstage, and I've been dining out on it ever since. <laughs> wow, impressive. Okay, uh, money, <laughs> money empowerment. <laughs> So to me, money empowerment is all about being self-sufficient and financially literate. And to me, financially literate means having the knowledge, skills, and confidence to make responsible and appropriate financial choices at every life stage. Excellent. Bill? Yeah, I, I, I like that. And I like the idea of that it's uh, granting the responsibility and the ownership um, and the authority to both earn and spend or manage money, especially when it comes to kids. Makes sense. Laura? Yeah, and I think um, that what Robin said, you know, it applies really well to kids because it really comes down to just knowing what to do. And so for a child, you know, empowerment might just be as simple as, um, you know, I like I'm buying something and I know what to do. And so, and, and also I really appreciate that her definition of financial literacy included um, skills and, you know, and, and ability and not just knowledge. Yeah. And that's, you know, Laura's jumpstart coalition <laughs> has lots to do with the, the financial skills uh, side of things. So thank you, Laura, who would like to go next? Trey. So I actually agree with everyone. And so I don't want to take up too much time adding to it, but I do think it's so important from the very youngest of ages to educate our kids so they understand what money is, what it means, and then how to use it. 
Excellent. Thank you, Trey. Cameron, do you want to jump in? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure I'm last. You know, it's it's hard to add to that because what everyone has said is so spot on. I agree entirely. And I do think what financial impairment comes down to is knowing enough about personal finance so that you can make smart decisions about your money. Makes sense. You got to be making more smart choices. Thank you very much. Those are great answers. Okay, let's move on to question two, which is, so at what age should we begin talking to our kids about money? I'd like to start with Laura Levine with this, but first, oh, and I also wanted to say kind of at what age and why at that age? Um, and Laura, fun fact. Okay, so um, I thought I'd share a fun fact about my son instead of me, and that is that my son attends Wilson High School, um, which is the alma mater of Warren Buffett. And so I thought I would share that as a, a topic appropriate for today. Wow, I, that's uh, excellent. <laughs> so we got Bruce Springsteen, we got Warren Buffett. <laughs> this is uh, it's impressive. Okay, so Laura, tell us what age do you think we should begin talking to our kids about money? Well, I think we should start talking to our kids about money as soon as they become curious about it, as soon as they have interest. And interest um, might just be in spending. You know, you go to the store and, and they want stuff. And I think what's important, um, especially when we're talking to parents of the youngest kids, is just to remind them that it's an introduction to money and that, you know, at um, elementary and even younger, uh, they don't, we're not telling them everything they need to know about finance at that point but just to introduce the topic of money to satisfy their curiosity and also to set a foundation for what they're gonna learn later. Makes sense. Would anybody like to add, Trey, did you have something you wanted to add there? Yeah, I would. Um, I think that a great way to teach your kids about money is to bring them with you when you go shopping. And I think that it's a parent's first instinct to leave them at home <laughs> if you can, because it can be kind of a hassle to bring them with you. But to see, for them to see you transacting can be very educational for them because then there's a cause and effect to money versus a, you know, things just appear out of nowhere like magic. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like that idea. Because I mean, that, that's that's the thing is I think parents sometimes feel like the shopping area is the that's the danger zone, right? And I think that's what you're, <laughs> we're trying to, we, we want, we want to empower them to, to know how to deal with the, uh, with that, with the danger zone, if we want to call it that. Um, did, Robin, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yes, um, I call those teachable moments because they're cropping up naturally in your day-to-day -day life with your child, with your children. And you just, you, people think, oh, it's so much time and effort to teach my kids about money. But really, if you look for those little opportunities where you're transacting, where you're doing something with money, and they really do happen throughout your day, you can sneak in those little money lessons. And they're very effective because, um, you know, you want to make sure the information you share always is age appropriate. So it's something that's going on in your child's life that they can relate to. Yeah, that makes sense. Bill. Well, I, I love Trey's idea. And I, I, to add to that, I'd simply say, pretend you're a sportscaster. So mm -hmm. you sportscast what's going on, especially if it's with credit cards. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, tell them I'm paying for this. I'm buying this now, but I'm going to pay for it later. And repetition is so important for kids. So you can kind of do it, you know, all the time you're with them and when you're making purchases. And I think that will help demystify what they're, what they're seeing because otherwise they just think it's, it's, it's magic. And then the other comment I would have is, um, I agree like the first time they ask you to buy something, they're actually ready, um, but it's never too late. So if you're thinking, oh, well, <laughs> my kid's a teenager or 18 or headed off to college, it's, it's never too late. And if I think of all the things that um, have changed with money as I've grown up, like there weren't index funds when I first grew up, there weren't Roth IRAs when I first grew up. So it's a, it's like a, it's a conversation that goes on forever, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. That's good. And uh, Cameron, go ahead. I, I agree that you should start talking with your kids as soon as possible, as soon as they show an interest. But I think it's also important to keep in mind, not just to explain the basics. This is what money is. Here is how we use it. But to explain to them why you, as a parent, parents, choose to spend money the way you do. 
have conversations about your values because it's important for your kids to understand the choices that you're making and how they impact the family as a whole. And this, you don't have to wait till they're teenagers to talk about this. In fact, I think the sooner you start talking about your spending values and your saving values and your giving values, that the sooner you start talking about it, the more it's going to be imprinted in their minds and it's gonna help them as they get older and start making money decisions on their own Hopefully it's going to guide them into making smart money choices and not just, hey, how much do I have in my bank account? Can I afford to buy this? But should I be buying this? Excellent. Well, thank you, Cameron. And um, Laura, one little one more. I just wanted to wrap it up by yeah. saying, you know, to the parents out there that there are guides, um, not only uh, the national standards that Jumpstart publishes, which has learning benchmarks, but also the CFPB's Money As You Grow. So there are things, there are resources out there that'll help parents understand sort of the right amount of discussion for certain ages. Great. Like John's book, so. <laughs> The Art of Allowance. No. No, no shameless plugs here, Ben. <laughs> I thought I'd do it for you. Okay. <laughs> or Ron Lieber's okay, so, book. Well, we have, yes, the, the opposite of spoiled. And yes. if there is a way, that's one thing I didn't check. If there's a way that we can put resources out available um, mm -hmm. through FinCom when this gets posted, we will definitely do that. So thank you for sharing those, Laura. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so now we're going to wade into these, uh, to the area where I, there, there may be some um, some 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 disagreement about how this how uh, how this works. So, this I'm going to direct this one to Bill, and this is the question: Is should you use an allowance to teach your kids about money? Um, but more importantly, should you tie it to chores? And uh, Bill, start with your fun fact. Okay. Well, my fun fact is that my uh, secret alternate career path would have been as a cartoonist. I was a, a Mad Magazine fan and had been drawing cartoons since a very young age. So if I wasn't uh, writing software, I'd be trying my hand at that, um, but probably doing a very poor job. Uh, as far as allowance and uh, tying it to chores, the word I like is budget. <laughs> I prefer to call an allowance a budget because it has all the right mindset. It's like the important thing is that you're constraining spending to cover a certain set of things. It could be a budget for just wants, could be a budget for entertainment, could be a budget for online gaming or clothing. Um, I think if you frame it in that context, it doesn't feel like a handout and that's just fine. The nice thing about allowance is super simple. So 70% of the folks who use our site, they go with just a straight allowance because it's simple to manage. That said, my ultimate uh, system would be a combo, a hybrid. It would be a fixed uh, budget for a certain set of spending. And then uh, it would be a, a, a set of unpaid chores that are responsibilities. Uh, it would even be a set of penalties that claw back from your allowance when you don't <laughs> do that. Um, and uh, it would be a set of opportunities to make extra money. And as you get older, that opportunity shifts to an external employer because there's nothing more informative than working for someone who doesn't care about you. Um, so that would be my answer to that. Very good. Who would like to add to to what Bill had to say? Cameron, I think you have something to say here. Yes, I'm. I'm um, and we certainly talked about this on your podcast. I we do something similar to that, Bill. We um, we actually do tie allowance to chores in our household. I know that can be somewhat controversial, and I want to point out that it's so important to figure out a system that works best for your family. So what I do might not necessarily work for your family, what Bill did, what Trey does. I mean, we all have our own systems and so you have to figure out what works. But we found in our house, what works is tying chores to allowance because we do believe, my husband and I believe that, you know, in the real world, you, you don't get paid for doing nothing. So you have jobs and that's how you make money. So my kids have jobs that they have to do. And actually um, we do it kind of in a way that you mentioned, Bill, we, if they don't do their jobs, they're penalized. So they lose money from their allowance. They have things they have to do without getting paid just because they're members of our family and they can earn extra money if they go above and beyond. And so um, we found that this works really well. My kids have been doing a great job of staying on top of their tours and if they don't do it, 
they lose money. And, you know, even my eight-year-old son is pretty darn honest at the end of the week when he hasn't made up his bed. And he's like, yeah, mom, I only get, you know, this much this week because I forgot to make up my bed two days. So that's what works for us. And Laura. Sure. Um, and I just maybe to add on to what Bill and Cameron said, um, I was delighted to hear Cameron say, you know, what works for your family and to hear Bill say budget because, you know, Right now, allowance is a luxury for a lot of families. And so um, if you're not able to give your kids allowance, there are still other ways to teach the same lessons about how to make that money last. And that's really what we're trying to get them to learn. Yeah, and I, I think this, it's a great, what Cameron brought up is this idea that it is, it's, it's very, it's gonna vary from family to family. Right. And I'm glad you brought that up, Laura, is that, uh, you know, if it, if it isn't the kind of thing that's going to work uh, in the current situation, then you, right. you know, there are other ways that you can teach these lessons. And mm -hmm. that's an excellent point. This is, uh, Trey or Robin, do you wanna add anything to the uh, allowance and chores discussion, Trey? I will a little bit. Um, I believe on your podcast, we talked about allowance. And at the time, it wasn't working for our family. We had tried it with our daughter and it was just not going anywhere. But then more recently, uh, she's 14 and we uh, created a plan very similar to what Bill and Cameron just mentioned. And it's been working really well. So I think um, if you try something and it doesn't work, you should always kind of pocket that idea and maybe revisit when the child is a different age. That's great. And it gets back to Bill's point before, which is it's never too late. And I think that is yeah. a, that is such an important point to make. Um, Bill, yes. Just want to emphasize that an allowance or even a lack of allowance or whatever could be arbitrarily small. And that the key thing I'm trying to get is a little ownership on the part of the child. So if it's just finding coins in the cushions, um, y you know, in the sofa cushions and depositing that, I think the really key thing is that you have some sort of tracking system, whether it's on paper or whatever, because then, you know, they're, they're tracking the concept that they have this ownership of this money, they have agency over it, they can make purchase decisions, they have to wait, that sort of stuff. Um, but it can absolutely be, um, could be ad hoc and arbitrarily small. That makes sense. Did you want to add something, Robin? Yeah, I guess the last thing I would add is that it teaches them at, at any age, really, that they, they have choices and once and money's a finite resource. So once they make a choice, they have to learn to live with the consequences. And starting early when they're younger, the stakes are naturally lower. So they get used to making a mistake. If you don't bail them out, they learn for the next time. And as the stakes get higher, as they get older, they have some experience with managing money. Fantastic. That's actually a great lead into the next question because, you know, we're going to talk about money lessons and I, this is something. So, so uh, before we started, Bill said he's now an empty nester and uh, my kid, I have my, my oldest is about to head to college. And then I have one behind that. Um, we have a, we have a, different people in different life stages on our panel. Uh, but one of the questions that comes up a lot is uh, what is the most important money lesson that a parent needs to teach a child um, before they leave the nest? Now, this is a bit of a, you know, the, the, maybe it's not just one, but let's just talk about one. And we're going to, I'm going to give this question to Cameron. You're going to lead this one off. But first, <laughs> we want that fun fact. <laughs> okay. I've kind of been racking my brain about what a fun fact about me would be. Um, so here's one. I, uh, I used to be quite proficient in the Russian language. I had a double major in Russian studies and journalism when I was in college. Now, I can't remember that much anymore, even though my husband can speak Russian, um, but <laughs> we don't bother to speak it together. But yes, once upon a time, I could speak it pretty well. How do you say allowance in Russian? <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know what? I'm not even sure. It's, budget. I might even know if it's like a real concept over there. So, um, <laughs> but um, no, don't even ask me that. Um, money, I could tell you, but I'm almost afraid to even say it now because I might not even pronounce it clear correctly. Um, I, gosh, there's so many lessons that are important to teach your kids. I think to narrow it down to one, it would be live within your means. And, you know, I guess, you know, don't spend more than what you have. Um, gosh, that, and that kind of comes into saving has to come into play with that. So 
live within your means. That doesn't mean spend everything you have though. It means also save money for the future too. I, uh, of course, I don't couch it in those terms when I'm talking to my children, especially my youngest, who is the biggest spender in our family. We have a lot of conversations about making smart money choices and not spending his, all of his money on toys, especially junk toys are going to fall apart, you know, within days after he buys them. Um, but this is something we talk to our kids about, you know, yes, you had this much money, but it doesn't mean that you need to spend it all, set some aside, you know, build up those savings. And of course, when they're little, the idea of saving for a car or college or retirement is so far off for them that, you know, maybe the message is just, well, let's save up money for something you really want instead of, again, that, you know, dinky toy that's going <laughs> to, like I said, fall apart within a couple of days. So focusing on that, I think, is a really important lesson to instill in your kids from an early age. Yeah, <clears throat> I can I can second the, the live. That was one of my grandfather's uh, pieces of advice that I didn't follow for quite a long time, which was <laughs> live beneath your means. You know, we used, we used to make fun of him because he would wear the same outfit all, you know, all the time. That's kind of like Sears beige outfit. And um, he had the last laugh. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, who would like to follow up on what Cameron had to say? Trey? Um, to, to kind of, in keeping with what Cameron said, I think it's important to teach your kids not to keep up with the Joneses. Um, I think uh, every family has their own budget and I think kids can get swept up in the really expensive sneakers that their friend has or a really fancy phone that their friend has. And when they leave the nest, if they have those uh, wants and needs in mind, they're gonna get themselves into trouble because they're gonna be starting out really small at first, right? So I think it's important to teach them that while they're at home, that to be happy with what they have and to live within their means and kind of educate them about what your means are so they have those values when they leave the house. Yeah, that's a, that is a terrific lesson because uh, keeping up with the Joneses, it's, it's, it's built into our systems, you know, so it's very difficult to deal with. And they're trying to keep up with you. So it's a never ending cycle. <laughs> right. So um, true. So true. Robin. I think another really important lesson is to pay yourself first. Now, I think, again, with kids, um, you know, with younger kids, that could just be saving towards some kind of goal that's important to them, something they want to get or buy. Um, but as you become, as you get older and you have more substantial goals, maybe it's saving for a wedding or down payment on a house, you really have to know, um, you know, how to act, how to put action around that. And I think one of the best ways is to automate it, you know, set up an automatic transfer from the account where you get paid or anytime you get some money in to a separate segregated savings account for a specific purpose that could be tied back to your values because that way you take the self-discipline out of the process and you don't wait until the end of the month when you may have very little money left to save you make sure it happens first right off the top by automating it great advice coming from our uh, our panel accountant <laughs> <laughs> exactly. laura yeah and then i would just say you know one of the things i always say is pay attention um, and especially as kids get older, um, and that's sort of just my, you know, my broad net that means, you know, whether it's, you know, reading something before you sign or, you know, paying attention to deadlines or, um, you know, keeping track of where your financial information is. Even if you don't know all the answers about finance, just pay attention. And that really will help you manage your money, um, I, I think, as well as, as just about anything. Yep. That makes sense. Bill? Uh, in, in retrospect, having uh, an empty nest now after raising five, five kids, uh, I would say if I could only pick one thing, I would uh, pick teaching them to be transparent with, uh, with, with their money issues, with trusted with their partner and trusted family members, which mm -hmm. hopefully includes me. Uh, because if they're comfortable, and this is largely my responsibility, making them feel comfortable talking to me about money, then we can uh, mitigate and even prevent disasters uh, 
much more rapidly than if we're not comfortable talking about money. So my number one thing would be to make sure whatever system you put in place or set of discussions you have with your kids that they're comfortable talking to you about their money issues because they're going to run into them. Everyone makes mistakes. And if they feel comfortable talking to you, that can really head off um, major problems. Great, great advice. Okay, we have our, uh, our last question uh, before our um, kind of fun bonus question. So this one I'm gonna to direct to Trey and it is how, and this really ties in very much to what we were just talking about. So how can I keep from raising spoiled kids um, in a world that screams at them to spend? And we turn to our consumer expert, <laughs> Trey, uh, yes, and remember, I'm, fun fact. Oh, fun fact. I'm so glad to have this question. Um, so fun fact about me, and this ties in with what I'll, I'll talk about, is that I, I collect vintage clothing. And uh, going thrifting it has been a great way for me to teach my daughter about money and spending. Um, so the answer to your question, I think, is that uh, parents today are... are really challenged because not only do we have those kind of social pressures that, that kids are encountering in the random commercial, but they have social media and they're constantly looking at things that are urging them to spend. Um, so to raise kids that aren't spoiled, it's really important to uh, create a culture at home like we talked about where excessive spending is not the norm. Um, so where your kids aren't growing up expecting to receive everything they ask for and a way to sort of remedy that is to bring them shopping and showing that cause and effect, um, setting limits at home, um, and also maybe discouraging uh, other family members outside of the home not to give too generously um, unless it's uh, financial gifts. And then you can kind of divide it up into you know saving, spending, donating, what have you. Um, um, but I think that creating that culture at home is really a great way to um, to to teach your kids that there are limits. And um, I think a good way to uh, teach this lesson is that, say, around back to school time to give your child a budget and um, then they'll very easily and quickly understand that if they're going to buy those two hundred dollar sneakers, how much that impacts their budget and how little that leaves them for the other things that they may need, like jeans and T-shirts and things like that. So I think that's a good way to teach that lesson. Fantastic. All lots of great advice there. Uh, Bill. Uh Love that. And so uh, I would say three things, and it springs off of what Trey was saying. Um, have them spend their own money that they earned. That's a, a constraining function right there. Uh, th the second would be help them develop what Warren Buffett calls an inner scorecard. So they're really judging themselves based on um, their values, their own values, and not the necessarily the values of, of those around them. And I, I love that concept of an inner scorecard. And then um, the last would be get a job. So uh, uh, as, a t as a teenager, if you can get a part-time job or, um, you know, a summer job is, is an incredibly uh, important experience in, in a child's life. And um, so hopefully at least one summer before they leave the nest, uh, they can have that experience. You know, I realized I didn't tie up my my answer to tie it back to vintage. So if I if you don't mind, if I could do that quickly, um, mm -hmm. that my daughter also has a love of vintage clothes now, um, which has been very helpful because she loves fashion and she's changing her style a lot. And so because we go to vintage stores and we shop at thrift stores, obviously not so much now, um, but <laughs> if she wants a new style, it's much less expensive to do it used. And it's also great for the environment. And that's an extra lesson that you can teach them. Um, so that vintage, uh, that vintage um, love that I have that I've been able to pass on to her has been a great way for us to limit the amount that we and she spends on clothes. Excellent. Thank you for tying that up because that, that, uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, uh, and it's very, that's very useful for people to know. Um, did anybody else want to add to, to this, uh, Cameron? I, I wanted to add that, uh, it's so important from the time your kids are young, to be comfortable telling them no. So many parents are so reluctant 
to say no to their kids, especially their young kids, because they don't want them to have that temper tantrum in the checkout line, which has happened with all three of my kids. And I just let them have the temper tantrum. And, and it's funny because now my kids, they, this is how they, they come to me to ask for things that they usually say, well, I know you're going to say no, but, <laughs> um, and I don't, you know, I, I use, I do what Bill does. You know, I tell them, well, you have money, you get an allowance, you can use your own money. And then they're like, oh, well, never mind. I don't want it. (laughs) But I think because I don't say yes to everything, um, when I do say yes, they're really excited about it. And that thing that they're getting, I feel like in a way it means more because, oh my gosh, mom actually said, yes, she's letting me have this thing. If I said yes to everything, they're just going to have a big pile of stuff that they don't even appreciate. And so mm-hmm. it's okay. It's really okay to say no to your kids. They're not going to hate you. In fact, I think they're going to, they're going to grow up, like I said, appreciating what they have more because they're not getting everything they ask for. Terrific. That's great, Cameron. I, I feel like we, uh, <laughs> there are other questions I want to ask. There is so much more that we can address here, um, but we are we're actually getting close to the, to the end of our time. I think we may be officially just slightly over time, but I, I want to just wrap things up with one additional question that I, I think uh, FinCon will humor me with, which is if everyone at FinCon could wear something on their t-shirt, okay? So this is, I'm going to direct this. I'll, I'll ask each of our panelists to answer this question. Uh, something on the t-shirt, what would you want it to say? So let's start with uh, Robin. So I would want parents to wear a t-shirt that says, I'm a good financial role model. Excellent. I like that. We're going to print all these t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Oh, I got one. Prepare your kids for a financial jungle. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it would say, uh, be transparent. Nice. Laura? Well, I, if I can't have a fam zoo t-shirt, I, I love that. Um, I, I, I think it, you know, it's one of the slogans and hashtags we've been using, and that's fueling financial education. There are a lot of us in the industry, we may not be the educators, but we support that financial education. And so fueling financial education is what I want on the t-shirt. Excellent. Um, Bill can probably get you that shirt if you want it. (laughs) Uh, Trey? Um, I think everyone should wear a t-shirt that says penny pincher on it. I think that we should all be penny pinchers and we should be proud to tell the world about it. Oh, I, I, that is fantastic. Thank you, Trey. Cameron. Okay. How about a shirt that says, let's talk about money. Yeah. I Does thought Cameron, to- I thought your shirt was going to say no. <laughs> no. no, no, it'll say go ask your dad. <laughs> No, Uh, I think, you know, this is all about talking about money and we want people to be more comfortable having these conversations, especially with our kids. Well, I want to thank all of you, Robin, Bill, Laura, Trey, Cameron. I I feel like, you know, the key themes here really are just mindfulness and conversation. I'm sure I, 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 there's, there's more to it, but that, that conversation, the idea of just opening up a conversation as soon as possible and, you know, being the trusted source for your kids or being open um, to the conversation and also understanding as we, as I mentioned in the beginning, you don't have to be an expert, right? You know, we're, we all can figure this out and, you know, we all have, you know, money issues that we've all dealt with, but those actually can be things you can discuss with your kids. So this has been a wonderful experience for me. I appreciate all of you coming on. I hope everybody out there in the audience has enjoyed this as much as I did. And um, thank you again for a terrific round of our FinCon X breakout panel. So thank you. Thanks.